Tom Fittian. Fittian? Close enough. And he is lead trooper developer at Cap Gemini. How's this for volume? Is, can everyone hear me? Hands at the back, can you hear me? Cool, okay, we'll make a start. Um, so, thanks for the introduction. So, yeah, I'm here from um, Cap Gemini, um, and we want to talk about supersizing Drupal. Um, so, making it big in, in every way, not just big websites and big scale, but big teams of people, big processes, big companies using it. Um, we heard in the keynote, adoption of Drupal is, is growing more and more every year. Um, so, let's look at some of the ways Drupal will help you get there. Uh, so we'll do a brief introduction, who I am, where we're from, what we do, talk about building big Drupal, um, we'll talk about the three pillars of scale, so performance, people and process, talk about care in the community, how Drupal is going to help people in Capgemini, obviously not all doing Drupal, but delivering big software projects all over the world for all kinds of exciting clients. In the Drupal space, we've got about 30 developers in the UK, we've got developers in France, Belgium, Holland. Uh, India, um, and we work very closely with, with all of them. Dries will have referred to us as the elephants. The elephants were coming um, in one of his, uh, his DrupalCon keynotes a few years ago. Large companies starting to adopt Drupal, um, and, and we're just here to share some experiences. So some of the clients we've worked with around the world, um, some of the biggest ones, Royal Mail, Post Office, and, and Parcel Force from the Royal Mail Group. Um, we've got Michael Page, where we're doing multilingual websites across the globe, something like 62 uh, websites in, in 31 languages. Um, in France, we've got Carrefour, um, and IGN, and TGV. Big project that's about to go live uh, with Eurostar, um, and, and lots of other projects around the globe. Some of the scales of things we're dealing with um, are, are pretty massive too. Um, one of our projects, we're using the e-commerce, Drupal Commerce platform, um, got 21 million orders in the last 12 months for that, so uh, some pretty hefty, uh, hefty order volumes going through there. Uh, we've got 14 million nodes in one of our Drupal 6 sites. We get about 5 million page views a day on another site, um, and as I mentioned, 64 sites, 32 languages around the world. Um, so some good fun stuff that, that keeps us up at night. So talking about Drupal and performance, um, and open source in general, as we heard in the the keynote. There's a lot of misconceptions that are, are starting to fade, but still a lot out there. So the big one, Drupal's slow, open source is insecure, and open source is free. All those big misconceptions, we're going to aim to disprove some of them and show that even though it's not free, you're still going to get incredible value. And to all the people who said Drupal doesn't scale, well, they're wrong. Um, so Royal Mail, Capgemini have been involved in other Drupal companies in the, in the ecosystem building some, some sites, getting absolutely huge volumes of traffic. White House, the Grammys, Economist and the Examiner are all, all dealing with, with very, very large scale. But the bad news is, developing big websites with Drupal is really no different to developing them with any other piece of software or any other technology. And let's just emphasize that a bit. Developing big websites with Drupal is no different to developing with any other software. And in fact, Drupal is no different to any other software. Bear with me. So the first thing we're going to talk about is how we scale performance. Any big website you build, any big software project you do, where you're starting to think about performance and complexity, you're going to start thinking about caching, reverse proxies like we heard in the, in the MTV talk, um, using things like Akamai, and other CDNs, looking at queuing to remove things from UI time, looking at using alternative databases that are optimized for performance, and looking at throttling, exposing different bits of your application to different pressures at different time. And you're going to face all of these, as I say, regardless of whether you've picked Drupal, whether you've picked WordPress, whether you've picked .NET, Java, or any other platform. The more your site performs, the more you're going to need to monitor it. You need to look at all your monitoring tools. So in terms of open source monitoring, we're talking products like Moonin and Nagios for looking after your, your servers, making sure they're healthy. Using tools that are relatively new, like New Relic and Boundary. We can talk about a bit about 
how, how well they work with Drupal and provide insight into how your Drupal site's performing, what it's doing, and helping you identify your, your bottlenecks. And social media, a bit of a, a strange one for monitoring, but a bit of a story about how Twitter saved our, one of our sites. We'd just gone live after, at the end of a, a big project that had been running for about a year, actually a bit longer. Um, we put it live, everything looked good, all the monitoring was good, we opened it up to the outside world, and we sat back and we watched Twitter. And about 15 minutes later, we saw a tweet, fairly innocuous, but mentioning a bug. I'm not going to tell you what the bug was. But it wasn't one that you'd wanted out there for very long. So we, we found the tweet within 15 minutes, we fixed the bug within 10, we got it live another five minutes later, half an hour on, and the site is standing, and no one else has really noticed. So keep it being aware of the power of social media to alert you to problems that traditional monitoring tools aren't going to help you pick up is very, very key. But again, that's not a Drupal problem. So people. First thing you think when you've got a big project is, we're going to need lots of people. Well, <coughs> we're going to need lots of people or some people working very, very efficiently. And so for efficiency, you're going to need good communication, and you're going to hope that people are listening to you and to each other. And what we mean by communication isn't just the talking to each other. It's making sure that everyone knows what they're doing, it, doing when they need to do it, tracking their progress, knowing what their bugs are, knowing what their targets are, and all those aspects of, of good project management. You're inevitable. Whenever you're dealing with any thing, actually, not just websites, your priorities are likely to change. Um, you need to know what your priorities are and be agile enough that you're going to respond to meet any changes in priority. But you need to have an owner of those priorities. You need to know who has the ultimate say on what's important, what gets done, and if there has to be a choice, which one gets chosen. You need to be able to split tasks out if, you've got, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have a large team of developers. Split those tasks out, know who's working on what, but also know that if you get to a crunch point and, and your priority is, is slipping, you've got enough agility within your resourcing to, to pull developers onto the, the highest priority item and get that thing done. Deliver the highest business value and then move on to the next one. Distributed working isn't necessarily what every business model is, is, is aiming for. Um, a lot of companies, you know, Yahoo, um, aiming at keeping everyone in an office working together. And for the most part, that's fine. And other businesses will have a, a truly distributed model. But you never know when it's going to snow and everyone's going to be stuck at home. You never know when you're going to be on the train to Vauxhall and a helicopter's crashed into a building across the road from your office, which happened to one of our projects not so long ago. Um, you, you don't know when there's going to be a need to suddenly sit in a hotel lobby and work. And, and get stuff done. And redundancy, the good sort of redundancy when we're talking about people. If you have a high performance website and you've got a really important bit of kit or a really important <coughs> process, you're going to have a redundant server. You need the same for your developers. You, you need to have no single points of failure. You can't rely on heroes. <coughs> You can't, you've got to rely on shared knowledge, on mentoring, on pair programming, and going back to the communication, absolutely key. There is a big but to this though. Projects consist of code. Code is written by people, so people deliver projects. There's going to be a time in your project when people need to pull together, work the crazy hours, but also the time when they need to ease off the pedal because they've been working those crazy hours to get something live. Your most important assets when you're delivering your website isn't your web server, it's not your code base, it's your people. So processes. Processes are an interesting one that need to scale as well. With all the complexity that you've got building these big websites, looking after these people who can work all over the place, you're going to need good process and strong processes to support them. With Drupal, it can seem like you're getting a lot from free, for free. You're installing it, and suddenly you've got a shell of a website. You click around for half an hour, 
you've configured a view, maybe you've installed panels, you've written some content, and yeah, the site's looking pretty good. And you find a custom theme from, from Drupal.org, and you install that, and yeah, okay, we're most of the way there. We can, we can probably put this live in a week or so. No. You still need to do all the things you do on any big software project. Drupal doesn't let you off the hook. Excuse the pun. So what are the things that you need to do? So we've talked about communication and clarity of purpose. You need to know what you're doing. You need to have testing, automated and manual. You need to be able to test as much as you can, as often as you can. You need continuous integration to help you get your code through different environments, allow your developers to develop in a safe environment. You need to know how your app's going to perform when you put it live. What is your expected load? How fast do you need to perform? What's going to happen when you expose 5 million people to it every day? And as part of that, you need a strong code review process. <coughs> Who's to say that someone's not going to build an item in their theme that does a node load on every page request that's in a loop, that's displayed in every block that's on the site, and suddenly you're bringing your site to, the, to a to <coughs> halt just because someone's not spotted a, an elementary mistake, but one that in the pressure of getting a project live is easily done. So code review, very, very important. Source control, as part of that, manage who can get, not who can commit to, to which environment, but have a process that says people have looked at code before it moves through to other environments, especially production. And as part of that, you need a strong release management process. Any project is going to pick up technical debt as it, as it goes through. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And, and be agile. I'm not saying use agile methodologies necessarily, although if you ask me should I, then, then yes, I would say adopt as much of agile as you can. But be agile in that things change. New modules are released, new approaches are found. Things happen that change your priorities and that change the ways of doing things, and you need to be able to respond to them. So on the clarity of purpose, your team need to know how to do things. How do they get code from their development environment to production? They need to know what the definition of done is. Is that that the code's in production? Is it that they've got to a staging environment and handed over a release note to a service team? Is it that it's been live for a month and there's been no reported issues? Define done so everyone knows what, that's, what that means. And also know what good looks like. Does good mean that you've got it finished in a day? Or does good mean that you took a week and you've got a test around it and you know how you're going to deploy it and you know how you're going to manage that when it's, when it's in a live environment? Without knowing those things, your developers are going to sit there and code what they think is important, how they think it should be coded, and how they think it should be released. And if they're not communicating, they're all going to do it differently. Testing. Testing is the thing you do at the end of the project, right? You need to know how you're going to test before you write any code. You need to know what your approach is. Are you going to automate all your tests? Are you going to have somebody who sits there and test the site every hour of every day? You're going to do a combination of the two. Do it regularly. Make sure you know what your key journeys are. You could start by installing Drupal, install Drupal in all your environments, and write a test that tests you can load the home page and log in. If that test ever breaks, you shouldn't be putting any code live. So, Build on a test base, know what your important journeys are, and, uh, and, and gradually enhance that, and maintain that as, as things change. Automate as much as possible, because as much as we all like the internet, looking at the same site every day, every week, every month, gets pretty tiring, and boring, and I expect we've all been there. And if you can do test-driven development, or behavior-driven development, then that's even better, because you're writing your tests as part of your specification and you're able to, to define what the site should do as part of a, as a, as a specification, and then build to it and make sure your code's meeting it right from day one. And if you want to know any more about um, behavior-driven development, uh, there's a guy called Graham at the back who um, actually can give you some demonstrations of, of what we've been doing with, with BDD. He's doing a presentation on Sunday for those of you, those of you that are here. The continuous integration, why, why would we do it? We want to fail fast, and we want to fail early. We want to know if we're going to have a problem when we release some code. So let's build every day. Let's build every time we commit. However you do it, it doesn't really matter. Just make sure that you've got something that's testing your build process, your release process, and your management of code through environments regularly. 
start your project with continuous integration. If you get six months into a project and then decide, actually, we want a way of managing code better between environments, it's very, very, very difficult to, to add that. Start, start from there, and, and you'll be in a much better position. Related to that, provide an environment where developers are allowed to make mistakes, and they're allowed to break that build. That might be your CI environment, it might be a test environment, but it should be somewhere that's not just their local development environment, or however they're managing their local code. They need to know that they can push something, experiment, and fail, and not get shouted at. And if they get shouted at, it's the person doing the shouting who's wrong, not the developer. Automate your environment setup so that when you need, what, need a new one, it's there and it's identical to dev or test or UAT or pre-production or whatever environment structure you've got. But make sure they're reliable because the day your developer is developing on PHP 5.4 and your code gets released on PHP 5.2, you're going to have some fun. And regularly build those environments related to the continuous integration. Regularly build on them, including how you deploy that code to production. Automate deployment to production and everything else will become easier. And the biggest thing to take away would be that it doesn't matter how your build script works. There's lots of tools that will help you do continuous integration, will help you build a site. Lots of them have been built on top of Drupal, separate to Drupal. It doesn't matter how it works, it just matters that you've got one and that it works. So performance testing. Know what you're aiming for. Know what your, know what your peaks and your troughs are. Know what your expected load is. Test against performance early and test regularly. Comes back to the, the slide on, on your functional testing. Benchmark your common journeys and, and look at any changes over time. You can look at memory usage, page execution, even just loading the home page and using a tool like XHProf to look at memory usage and, and, and um, page execution time. And then doing that every day, that will tell you as you add more complexity, is the site getting slower and slower and slower? And is that a trade off that's going to cause you a problem? And acknowledge, most importantly, that production really is the only place where you're actually going to test this. As much as the performance testing you do um, is, is valuable and can give you some insight into bottlenecks and potential problems, until you get real load and real behavior, you're not going to know how it's really going to perform. <coughs> and know your peaks. I mentioned two of the clients that, that we're working on, um, Royal Mail and, and Eurostar. So the big peak for Royal Mail is Christmas, when everyone's sending each other Christmas cards and presents, and Amazon's delivering everything. So they were, everyone's tracking their parcel and buying stamps and, and doing all the, all the interaction they would do on the, on the Royal Mail website, and traffic volumes increase four or five fold over, over a normal week. Eurostar, I was in Morocco when that volcano went off, so that was some fun. Um, but Eurostar's big fear is a volcano and everyone wants to catch the train because there's no planes in the sky. So again, there's a peak, model it, understand what you're testing for. I mentioned code review. And these are two graphs where I've anonymized it a little bit, but these are from one of our projects where a code review process was introduced relatively late into the project. And the top graph is the percentage of code each day that was reviewed. And the bottom, of gra bottom graph is the number of bugs that were raised those days. So you can see as the green increases and more and more code is being reviewed, less and less bugs are being raised because people are catching the bugs before they're in an environment where someone's going to test them. It doesn't catch everything, but it can catch a lot. And technical debt. Don't make the mistake of loading everything up in one release. And also acknowledge that once you've done a delivery, you're going to need to come back and you're probably going to have some, some bits left over. You're going to have bugs that you found. You're going to have new requirements that came along as you were exploring and, and developing functionality. Unanswered questions. You need to, in your plans, allow for unknowns allow for discovery of problems and new work and include that in your, in your future planning. Very, very little is perfect and performant and polished for the end user first time. That means you're going to need to do some rework. So that was probably all a little bit depressing and you're probably all wondering 
I don't want to. I don't want to build a website, and I don't want to use Drupal. But actually, here's the good news. If you pick Drupal, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. A lot of hard work's already been done for you. There's a lot of people building very big, very performant, very complex websites in Drupal. You're not the first. Some problems have already been solved. So there's a distribution called Pressflow, which is a fork of Drupal 6, which is highly tuned for performance. There's lots of published approaches for solving particular performance issues. Um, Catch, one of the uh, Drupal 8 maintainers, um, has, a, has a GitHub repository with loads of performance patches in. There's a page on drupal.org uh, which you can go and look at and read about various patches that will give you small, medium, and some major, major boosts to performance in Drupal, particularly in Drupal 6. In Drupal 7, lots of work's been done for, for Drupal 8, optimizing the performance of things like the Fields API, and that's been backported into Drupal 7 to give Drupal 7 users that performance boost. And continually, performance improvements from new versions of Drupal are being backported into older versions of Drupal to give those performance boosts. The experts are out there. Look in the issue queues, people are bound to have the same problem as you. It's very, very rare to find a problem that no one's come across before, particularly a performance one. There's a Drupal high performance group where people regularly post, ask questions, how to solve a particular performance problem, and there's a wide community of people responding, giving advice on various setups and circumstances that, that will help them build a more performance site. Talk in IRC, go to meetups, come to Drupal camps, we've made the first step, and Drupal cons, which are even better. And if it's really, really big, then you can join the large-scale Drupal program, which is something that Acquia are taking a, a big lead on and Capgemini are, are a part of, and is a really, really valuable initiative. The other benefit is that Drupal plays really, really well with every other, not every other, lots of other tools that are out there. From one project, these are all the tools that Drupal talks directly to. And actually, I think I've missed a couple off now that I look at it. But some of these will be functional and provide additional functionality that you wouldn't want to try and build in, in Drupal. Um, products like Adobe Lifecycle, and some of the CRM functionality in Salesforce, um, Cordis and, and Camel for business process management and, and integration. And then you've got performance tools like Memcache, uh, as used for reverse proxy caching, ActiveMQ for queuing, uh, and things like that, that all help take a load of complexity and scalability away from, from Drupal. Drupal doesn't have to do it all. And, and even better, Drupal can help you not do it all. So then contribution, and the value of contribution to your project. Contribution will encourage good developer practice, so contrib contribution to the Drupal community. For testing, any time you want to propose a patch to core, you've got to accom accompany that patch with a test. If it doesn't have a test, it won't go in. Code review. The, the issue queue review process means that every issue will be minim at minimum reviewed by two people. One to get it to reviewed and tested by the community, and another when it's eventually committed. Minimum two people. <coughs> That also applies to um, module sandboxes. So when, when you join Drupal.org and you, you've got a, an idea for a, a module you want to contribute and you want to get that promoted from a sandbox for the first time, the encouragement there is to go and review other people who are going through that process as well, review their code, point out areas for, for improvement, or say, great job, you've done it all right. But the, the emphasis there is on looking at other people's code, have other people look at your code, and, and both learn from that. <coughs> and then technical debt. So Drupal feature development only continues whilst the critical issue threshold is at a certain level. Once it, once it hits that point, all focus for feature development moves on to resolving those critical issues and making sure the product progresses, but progresses stably, securely, and performant, performantly. And share what you've done. So again, from one of the projects that, that I've been working on recently, these are some of the things we've contributed back to the Drupal community, either as patches on issue queues or as contributed modules. So we've got a root module, um, which is for, for doing multi-step journeys using <coughs> panels. Stomp, which is for uh, communi com excuse me, communicating with message queues using the Stomp protocol. SQL no revisions, which was a performance improvement for not storing a revision of certain entity types in Drupal 7. 
and providing an alternative database backend. We've got a key contrib contributor to the Drupal 8 CMI initiative, which is really, really valuable in terms of meeting configuration management and deployability of Drupal across, across environments. So that's very, very important. Uh, test and target is a recent one we've, uh, we've released, which is for doing multivariant testing um, using the Adobe test and target tool. Um, there's panels filter cache for caching panels, but taking into account nodes that have had filters uh, used upon them. And various core and contrib patches that I won't list here. And there's, there's a few more besides, and plenty from other projects. And so that takes you into your contribution cycle. You start contributing, you start code reviewing and testing, and writing tests, and you'll improve your developer practices. Improving those practices will improve your developers. Improving your developers will improve your products. And improving your products will help you contribute back more to the Drupal community. And everybody wins. So wrapping up, I said at the start that Drupal is no different to any other software. But the community is. The community of Drupal developers and Drupal everything will help you build more performance sites, will give you advice, and it's basically just great fun. But you can scale. If you're building big, a lot of your problems exist already, before you've even chosen Drupal. Drupal provides ways to solve these problems, not all of them in Drupal. But the Drupal community is one of the best communities to have a problem in. And Drupal does scale in performance, in people, and in process. So that's me done. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, it's about uh, having your platform as a configurable, rebuild, scriptable um, certain platform. I was just wondering how you view keeping the Drupal code abstracted from that so that if you do need to pivot on your platform for whatever reason, you can install Drupal on a single server or a big platform if you want to talk about that a little so the question there, just, to, just for, for anyone who, who didn't hear that, was, um, was around uh, continuous integration and, and deployment and, and um, thinking about different uh, environments and whether we'd keep the uh, code, the Drupal code, separate from our, our configuration management. Of that, correct? Yeah, so yeah. the Drupal code's not relying on your platform. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's what, we're, what we're doing on one of our projects. So our, we have, we're unfortunately still using SVN on one of our, our, one of our projects. Um, so all of our code is, is maintained in that SVN repository. We then have a separate SVN repository which contains our build, our build script, and our build script when it gets checked out will go and get the Drupal code that we've told it to do uh, and, and then build it. So we can then check out our build repository on any server and, and build wherever we are. So we can fairly rapidly spin up different environments or move to a different hosting provider um, or, or completely different uh, setup and still be able to build the Drupal site with the Drupal settings um, very, very easily. So it's not not purely using Drupal to build itself. Um, it's providing a framework around Drupal to, to get it working. Like, so one of the slides was it doesn't matter what the build script is as long as it works. And I think that's very key in terms of you could just use what Drupal gives you in terms of installation profiles and, and using features all the time to, to build everything. Um, but building a layer that's on top of that lets you, lets you take that approach and, and secure yourself a little bit. Uh, the whole environment, you know, you've got the testing, continuous integration, uh, uh, caching and so forth. Um, is, is there anyone out there that's actually built or, or you know, created a, an, an install profile for the wider, you know, uh, environment rather than just the Drupal, because obviously the Drupal stuff, there, there's the, the press flow, but what about the wider, wider stuff and maintaining it and all of this? Sure. Um, so the question there was whether anyone's built a full stack in a reusable way rather than just the, the core of Drupal um, being performant. Um, so yes is, is the short answer. So there's companies like Acquia, um, Acquia's, um, Acquia's cloud, managed cloud, um, uh, Pantheon, uh, which all provide means of having a, a build environment that is built on a performant <coughs> Drupal stack. Um, so off the top of my head, and some of the Acquia guys will tell me if I get this wrong, but um, Acquia will build in um, Varnish, it'll build in Solar, it'll build in for, for Search, um, it can build in Memcache as, a, as an option uh, um, for caching. Boost as well, an APC. Boost, boost and APC, which are, yeah, can 
can be configured on, on lots of lots of um, environments. Yeah, APC is a is a key one. Um, yeah, so so yes, there's companies out there doing it, um, and I'm sure if you come around and talk to us, um, we can we can talk a bit more about it. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll uh, let everybody go and get some lunch then. Yeah, cheers, Tom. I don't know if I, if I used the word awesome yet. Yeah, that was really good. Um, so lunchtime. Lunch is at the 